once again, dear church family. I offer you greetings in the name of Jesus our Lord, through whom the whole family of God has been named. We have been named by Jesus. Friends, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. We gather uh, this morning not to, not to think or talk about the life of our Lord, but to think about the death of our Savior. You know, 50, 50 weeks of the year. <clears throat> we gather on Sunday mornings, or 51 weeks of the year, we gather on Sunday mornings and, and we give our hearts to God because we are desperate to see God's uh, truth and God's love and, and all that God has lived out in our life. This morning, though we gather together to declare the reason that God's word is livable in our lives. God's word is livable because uh, we belong to Jesus, because he died in our place. And that's why we're here today. So as we prepare, uh, let us begin with prayer. Oh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we, uh, as we prepare to hear from you this morning, we just ask that you would just open our hearts. Uh, we, we desire to be malleable, Lord. Uh, we desire that our hearts uh, be continually transformed. So, Lord, we ask that you would give us uh, eyes to see and ears to hear, but mostly, Lord, hearts to receive. Uh, the incredible Savior, who is Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Friends, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please open them to Mark's Gospel. And I am going to read all of chapter 15 uh, this morning, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just, I'm going to spend all of my time and energy um, and I'm going to preach from verses 21 to 39, but I think it's, it's important to hear all of chapter 15. Now, we have been in Mark's gospel since last, I think, I think it was March the 15th of last year. Now there, you know, at Christmas we, we did some different things in that, but we have been in Mark's gospel now for uh, just over a year. And it will come to a conclusion, um, I, I believe, where it should on, on Sunday. <clears throat> when we celebrate the resurrection. But I think that's pretty remarkable that, that we have spent the last year uh, going through um, almost verse by verse of the Gospel of Mark. And, and here, here in chapter 15, we come to the absolute pinnacle of, of what Mark uh, desired for us to understand uh, that his Gospel was about. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Mark chapter 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away to be delivered over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? <clears throat> See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had, been, who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do what he usually did for them. And he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? <clears throat> for he had perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. <clears throat> but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have, to have him release for them Barabbas instead. 
And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on, put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, (coughs) the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of, of skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their their heads and saying, Ah, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him uh, to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this is the way he breathed his last and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger and of Joseph. And Salome, when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came with them, came, <coughs> excuse me, up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also, who also <coughs> himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage. And went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he had learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph uh, bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the word of the Lord. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. <clears throat> of all of the, of the, the sermons that, that I preach in a year, the one that I struggle with the most uh, is the Good Friday message. And, and it's not because, you know, I, I don't understand it, but it's because it is, it is such weighty matter. Um, it, it is 
it's such weighty matter that I don't think any single sermon can, can do it justice. The magnitude of the atoning sacrificial death of Jesus is such an incredible gift to humanity that it is really beyond comprehension in some ways for preachers to be able to communicate it well. But at the same time, it is the single most important aspect of our Christian faith, and it must be communicated. (coughs) And so we will trust that the Holy Spirit uh, does something usable for our hearts this morning. I was thinking the other day, and I'm often curious, um, and, and I was thinking the other day, because I, I heard somebody just sort of, just somebody out of the blue, just said, God is love. And, and it, got, it made me think, and generally that's kind of not a good thing when I start thinking, but it, it got me to thinking, God is love. And, and, and in some Christian circles, that, that phrase, that terminology, God is love, has almost been reduced to like a catchphrase. It's almost been reduced to like a bumper sticker. And, and, it, and it's become sort of a catchphrase for people trying to understand the reason that Jesus died on the cross on our behalf. Why did Jesus die? God is love. And there's no question, there can be absolutely no question that God loves us. Right? We are his creation. There is nothing that he wouldn't do for us. There is absolutely no question that God loves us. He he gave everything to redeem us. He loves us, there's no question. He loves us so much that, that he bore our sin and our shame. But at the same time, to reduce the cross... To the simple phrase, God is love, also, I don't think, does it justice. And and also, that catchphrase has also become a stumbling block for others. They say, if God really is love, why then would he send his son to die? If God is love, why did Jesus have to die? Why wouldn't he just pardon all sinners if God really loved us? Why wouldn't he just say, I forgive you all? No sacrifice required. Why does he need the cross? This this phrase, God is love, it both reduces the cross and it causes others to stumble. And I was thinking about that. and, And I was thinking about, you know, it may be our, you know, our human, in our humanness, we would go, well, you know what? If we were God and we loved everybody, then we would just pardon them. No further questions. And, but the reality is, is that wouldn't fix the problem. To just pardon people without sacrifice doesn't fix the problem between humanity and God. And well... You know, the terminology varies a little bit. These misunderstandings and oversimplifications really have become prevalent, maybe all too prevalent uh, in our society, but also in our churches. It's only a perfect love that's willing to sacrifice its own well-being that is a love that is worthy of redeeming souls. As human beings, we are incapable of a pure and selfless love, that kind of love that is capable of redeeming souls. That God is love. He is a pure and perfect love. But that is only a part of the equation. Which means that to understand Good Friday, 
We have to better understand the character of God because the atoning sacrifice of Jesus is only possible because of the character of God. But unfortunately, that God is holy and righteous, that he is holy and righteous and pure, does little to penetrate the the consciousness of our culture these days. We want God is love because that fits on a bumper sticker. We don't want we don't want a phrase that says God is love and holy and righteous and pure. Because that's not nearly as easy to deal with. God loves us to be sure, but before we can hang our hats on God's love, we must first come to terms with God's Justice. God is the holy, righteous, pure, and perfect judge who is love. And it's out of this truth that we come to understand that the atonement is born out of the perfect sacrificial love and perfect obedience that has always existed between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Until we understand this, we will never understand the magnitude of the cross. Because the cross of Christ is born directly out of the character of God. That God is holy, pure, and righteous demands that amends be made to God by anyone who stands condemned against God's nature. That God is holy, pure, righteous, just, and loving demands that his grace extends towards anyone who accepts his favor. That God is holy, righteous, pure, loving, and obedient means that it is he who bears the sin and guilt of those who stand condemned, which is all of us. The message of Good Friday, then, is the message for everyone who knows that they stand condemned before God but wants to receive, but wants to receive his grace. Because it is on the cross. It's on the cross that we don't just see God's love. Because the cross is where God's mercy and justice meet. In chapter 15, verses 16 through 20, um, we read the gospel writer Mark shows us the humiliation of Jesus. We don't often talk about the humiliation. We talk about the cross, we talk about the crucifixion, but we don't often talk about the humiliation. The text says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, and they called together the whole battalion. The whole battalion is 600 soldiers. It's not a few It wasn't a few soldiers that were kind of milling about. They called together the whole battalion, 600 soldiers, to mock Jesus. They clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling in homage to him. 600 600 soldiers beating him on the head, spitting on him, mocking him. Not just a few. Not just a few. Not just a bunch of guards that happened to be around that had nothing better to do. This is a coordinated. 600 hundred soldiers beating him on the head, spitting on him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his own clothes and they led him out to crucify him. In the whole history of the world, every founder of every major religion 
has found a way to overcome their circumstances or has found enlightenment or has been lifted uh, uh, to victory from the mundane, but no founder of any religion has ever been humiliated the way Jesus Christ was. The founder of every world's religion has overcome. Only, only the Savior of the world dared let himself be humiliated for us. Every other religious leader said to the masses, follow these ideas, follow the things that I tell you, do these things, prepare in this way. And if you do it right, if you do it well enough, maybe, just maybe, if you do things in the right order, for just the right amount of time, if you do them religiously and acceptably, you may achieve for yourself, or you may find yourself acceptable enough to gain entry into some ethereal afterlife that must be way better than this one. That's the story of every other religion on the face of this earth. Only Jesus, the Son of God, allowed himself to be humiliated and murdered by crucifixion, which, friends, is one of the most heinous methods of torture that has ever been devised by man. Only the Son of God allowed himself to be humiliated and murdered so that the glory of God could be revealed in every single person. Not on the basis of what they do, but on the basis of what he did. This is the gospel. The gospel says you can come to God. Not because you are good enough. Not because you do the right things. You can come to God because Jesus is good enough. Because Jesus did it perfectly. Every religion says, earn your salvation. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ says, your salvation has been earned for you. Will you receive it? Why does every writer of the New Testament go to such great lengths to tell people that the founder of our faith, Jesus, that he died on the cross? He died in shame. He died humiliated. And yet he and he alone is the savior of the world. It's because he, he died in shame. It's because he was murdered. It's because he took our sin that we can be a part of the family of God, that we can exist. Only only those who trust in Jesus for the salvation of their souls will ultimately see God. And it is true because darkness fell. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. <clears throat> Friends, whenever there is darkness mentioned in the Bible, it's associated with, there's, there's some really basic ideas, right? The first association um, of darkness is with chaos and disorder. Genesis 1 verse 2, the earth, was, um, the, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face, face of the deep. Right, we know the, the Hebrew translation, it says it was the, the Spirit of God was over the chaos. It was dark, there was chaos, there was no form, it was a void. Darkness in the Bible represents chaos, disorder, decay. The word uh, uh, 
Translated darkness in this case is the word that means obscurity. Right? The kind of darkness that's absolute. It's not just that there is something covering the light. Right? Before, before God brought order to the chaos, the darkness was absolute. The kind of darkness where you can't see your hand when it's right in front of your face. The Bible also teaches us that darkness symbolizes spiritual darkness. A darkness that exists in a world without God, such as in Psalm 107, 10, 11. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. For those in spiritual darkness, uh, it's, it's a darkness without God. It's like sitting in the shadow of death. The Bible teaches us where there is only misery and pain. Darkness in the Bible is also congruent with the judgment that God delivers on all those who refuse to acknowledge his lordship. There's several places in the Bible that we see this darkness worked out as a sign of God's judgment. And this is the darkness that we're going to camp on uh, for a few minutes here, but we're going to see how it, it all relates. In order to get to the darkness of Jesus' crucifixion, let's, let's look at the Old Testament book of Exodus a little bit more, where we were on Wednesday night, uh, as we desire to understand the Lord's Supper a little bit better. So if we turn to Exodus chapter 10, verses uh, 21 to 23, we read about the plague of darkness that God sent over Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. This is the ninth plague that God sends on Egypt. It's the final plague before God wields his, his sword of divine justice against the firstborn of, of anyone in Egypt who doesn't put their faith in the substitution of the sacrificial lamb. This is a supernatural darkness. This isn't somebody just turned the dimmer down. This is a supernatural darkness that comes over Egypt. It's not just, you know, somebody put a big board up over the sun. It's a complete lack of light. That The text says it lasted three days. And it, and it says that it was a darkness that could be felt. No one in Egypt moved or rose from their place for three days, the text says. And so, dear loved ones, what we are, are meant to understand is that, that, that this is the divine judgment of God coming. That the divine judgment of God is a move back to the darkness of chaos. <clears throat> it is a complete and utter darkness. God brought order to the chaos. The first, his first act of bringing order to the chaos once he formed things is he brought light. Ninth plague in Egypt was to remove the light for three days. The language that's used here is that that the darkness could be felt. They did not see one another, nor did they rise for three days. This is the language of death. <clears throat> Without light, there is death. Without light, there is destruction. Without light, there is chaos. <clears throat> Without light, there is decay. We have in our, our basement... This little greenhouse thing. And Nathan being quite the gardener that he is. <coughs> we, we start like to start the tomato and pepper plants. And he's got all manner of things going on down there. 
and uh you know because we like to have them get the, a head start so that when when uh you know it warms up in the spring when the soil's warm enough we then transplant them and you're not starting them from seeds out in the garden but every now and again every now and again um forget to turn the lights on right the you know whatever the lights are that give kind of light like daylight now nathan is a heck of a gardener he waters them and you know they've got all the right nutrients and he feeds them with you know fertilizer and all that sort of thing but every now and again we forget to turn the lights on for a few days doesn't matter that they have enough water doesn't matter that they have enough nutrients if there isn't enough light they immediately start to die they immediately start to decay. That is what's happening in Egypt. Without light, right? Plants die. Just as the physical side of life needs light to survive, so does the spiritual aspect of us as human beings need light to survive. But we need a different kind of light. We need a divine and supernatural light. We need the, the light that only God can give to survive. That's why uh, in John 1 uh, verse 4, the text says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We need the life, the light of Jesus in our life in order to survive. Right? And, and that's why this Exodus narrative is so important for us to grasp. If you see, like if we just read them and go, okay, well that's kind of cool. God, you know, sent all this stuff. Right? And, you know, just made it really so bad that, that Pharaoh let them go. If, if we just see them as, as a bunch of events, we will miss the point of what God's doing here. It's as if the text is reminding us that in the kind of unrelenting darkness that God sends, it's like experiencing the absence of God, which brings only death to anyone who experiences it. Right? And it brings physical death, but more importantly, it brings spiritual death. The plagues in Exodus are a mini, and I mean mini, taste of the day of God's judgment. The day that God will judge everyone. God's judgment in Exodus comes to a conclusion only when God wields his sword of justice over the Passover. That's what the Exodus is all about. It culminates with the sword of God, the God's sword of justice. That's what Judgment Day looks like. The ninth plague, the plague of darkness that preceded the Passover, therefore pointed to a reality that, that one day would come true for those who don't by faith trust in the Lordship of God. And in that day, they would experience the utter void of unfathomable darkness. The text says that no one could see one another. No one rose for three days. Everything came to a standstill because they were consumed by the darkness. When God removes himself from the equation, darkness becomes all-consuming. This is what death outside of God looks like. It's total consciousness where you can't see anyone and you can't rise because you are consumed by the darkness. That's the torment of hell. For three days, this complete and supernatural darkness was over every part of Egypt except where the Israelites were. For three days, there was no rising because God's judgment for sin was on Egypt. Isaiah uh, 13, the prophet, is looking forward to the judgment day and he says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for its inequity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. 
just about every time God's judgment is spoken of in the Bible, darkness is a part of the equation. But what it also means is that as great as the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt is, because this darkness only lasted three days, its function is to point to a much bigger and much more profound exodus that God ultimately had in mind. God's purpose is not simply an exodus from physical bondage, but an exodus, an exodus from spiritual bondage of sin, that the heart um, that it is that is at the, the heart of death. God's not just interested in releasing people from physical bondage. He's interested in releasing people from the spiritual bondage of sin. Because sin is at the root of death. <clears throat> Mark 15, and 34, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The sixth hour, you know, was 12 o'clock, which makes the ninth hour three in the afternoon. For three hours, a supernatural darkness overtook the land. Once again, the judgment of God had descended, but this time it was descending on a person. It was the darkness of God's judgment descending on the Son of God. It was the sword of God's judgment falling on Jesus, the innocent, spotless Lamb of God. All the darkness and all the judgment that should be on us, that should have befallen on us to satisfy rightly the holy and righteous justice of God, but instead, because of the holy and righteous love of God, it fell on Jesus Christ. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus start quoting Psalm 22? Because when the darkness fell on Jesus, God the Father did to Jesus what we deserve to have done to us. And that is, he completely withdrew his presence from Jesus. Jesus experienced complete and total darkness. That which is most precious to Jesus, the light that gives us life, was withdrawn from Jesus and he breathed his last. For the first and only time from all eternity, the Father did not have the Son and the Son did not have the Father. For three hours, Jesus was plunged into absolute darkness and desolation to the point that he could not see anyone and he could not rise. We're told in John 19.30 that Jesus' final words were, it is finished. And then he gave up his spirit. In Isaiah 53.12, the prophet said, he poured out his soul to death and makes intercession for the transgressors. The Apostle Paul would later tell the Roman church that God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was plunged into total and complete and absolute darkness. The total and complete and absolute darkness that we deserve. That's where he was plunged. There was only one person who was there that day that understood what he was witnessing. And this brings us to the absolute pinnacle of Mark's gospel and the reason why Jesus willingly gave his life on the cross. Verse 37 to 39, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in, <clears throat> that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this was the Son of God. 
The point of Jesus' death was that there was, that there was no longer a barrier between God and man. From the time of Adam and Eve's betrayal in the Garden of Eden and guard, and God barred the entranceway with his sword of judgment until the moment the curtain in the temple was torn, there was a chasm between God and humanity. But in Jesus Christ, that chasm has been filled in because now in Jesus, everyone has access to God. The curtain in the temple was, was this, was, it, it wasn't like a flimsy little veil. It was thick. It was almost like a wall. It wasn't even like, it, I don't think we really have anything that, is, that, it, that, that relates to it. But it was so thick that this curtain that, that separated the Holy of Holies was almost like a wall. It was so heavy and it was so thick. It blocked, this curtain blocked access to the Holy of Holies behind which the Shekinah of glory of God resided. And just so that there was no doubt in anybody's mind about the fact <clears throat> that anybody was now able to come to God, to the throne of God, the veil, this thick, heavy curtain, tears from top to bottom. And just so there is no more... Um, Doubt, the first person that recognizes the importance of what occurred on the cross, it's not one of the disciples who are in hiding. It's not uh, one of the women who were there present. It wasn't Mary Magdalene. It wasn't Mary the mother of James the Younger. It wasn't Salome. It was a lowly Roman centurion. It was the last person that you would expect to get it. It was a hard-as-nails soldier. Someone who had seen more death than anyone should ever have to see. Someone who has seen people die, many at his own hand. He was the first to understand the significance of what just happened on the cross. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This hard as nails. This nobody. To be a centurion meant you were just, you, were, you weren't a high class Roman Person. You may have been um, a conquered and just decided to join the army because it was better than whatever the alternative was. This guy didn't have a commission. He was a centurion. He was a foot soldier. He's hard. He's seen way more than anybody should have to see when it comes to death and dying and destruction. The text says that he stood facing Jesus, and when he saw the way Jesus died, when he saw that Jesus died crying out for his first love, my God, my God, the centurion knew in the depth of his heart that this indeed was the Son of God. And, for, and, and realized that this is a big statement for him. Right? Only Caesar was known as the Son of God. For this Roman centurion to say that surely this man was the Son of God, this is a big statement. He calls this lowly Jewish rabbi hanging on the cross the Son of God. Jesus died in complete and absolute darkness, abandoned by the Father, abandoned by his friends, abandoned by his disciples, abandoned by his own people, the Jews who had hailed him as their Messiah as he rode in to Jerusalem. And even through 
the absolute darkness of hell, abandoned by everyone he loved. He died loving us all. In Jesus' desperate cry, my God, In his desperate cry to his God, in his darkest hour, his love for God never wavered. Jesus died in complete love and complete obedience to God. Never did his love for God or obedience to God ever fail. In the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, Obey me about the tree and you will live. And he didn't. And so sin and death and decay entered the world. In the Garden of Gethsemane, God said to Jesus, Obey me about the tree and you will die. And he did. And so sin and death no longer have power because in Jesus, God is making everything new again. Final thing that I would just like to point out this morning is this. When we started Mark's gospel a year ago, we started at the very, at Mark chapter one, verse one, which said, this is, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The absolute Mount Everest of of Mark's gospel is the very declaration of what Mark said his gospel was about. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let us pray.